In this video, the 1HP staff further breaks down Corpse Husband's physical symptoms and provides some underlying physiology and science to help you understand what might have led to his acute and chronic symptoms. We also provide some clarity using pain signs as to why it did get so chronic in the first place. Just as a reminder, we are not making this video to give medical advice, nor critique other medical providers, or even say that we understand what's going on based on what was discussed or found on the internet. But based on some of the things that we have seen, there are concerns regarding his experiences, as well as what he is speaking about in his social media and um, YouTube posts. So we wanted to highlight those, and here is the bio part, part number two. Uh, if you don't remember, around two years ago, I started getting really bad health problems, and I know that's very vague, but the problems themselves were very vague. Um, I was 18 or 19 at the time, and uh, doctors weren't believing me with the issues I was having, and they were causing me problems uploading, which is why the upload schedule started getting slower and slower. Years ago, I thought it was fibromyalgia, but at the time, doctors weren't believing me because I was 19, in shape, seemingly okay. Uh, but then the problems started getting worse, and it started with uh, my eyesight. I wasn't able to read stories because uh, my eyesight was going, and they wouldn't. They, whenever I would get checked for a prescription, they would tell me I have 20/20, but then I wouldn't be able to see when I'm reading. Anyways, I was in and out of the doctors, f like, I think I've been like 40 or 50 times in the past six months, maybe like five months. Anyways, um, in October or September of 2018, things got really, really bad. And uh, I started getting uh, brain zaps, if anyone knows what those are. And my vision would go and it would happen. And, um, for those of you that don't know, I live alone completely. I don't really have any family that I talk to or friends in the area and living the double life thing makes things complicated. So I didn't really have anyone here and I went to the hospital for it and they were telling me like they have to give me check for a brain tumor and all these things like that. And, um, I found out right after they told me that I need to get checked for a brain tumor that I, uh, didn't have insurance anymore, which was... A very big shock to me at the time I eventually got an MRI and those of you that follow me on snapchat uh, have seen all the blood work and have seen all the the MRIs I've had to do so uh, they cleared me of no brain tumors but I was left with the like the issue of wondering what's happening to me I I stayed in my apartment for months I started like grub hubbing food to my house every day I'm losing thousands of dollars per month and like I just I lost track of time completely I was just in bed for days and days and days <laughs> and um, February I woke up one day and I couldn't feel I was like I'm gonna get back into videos like I had friends hyping me up and uh, February I woke up and I lost feeling in my arm like I don't want to say lost feeling completely because I could still move it and everything like that but it started in my my right wrist really bad and I was like, oh, fuck. I uh, went to the doctors. They were like, we don't know what's wrong with you as usual. You have fibromyalgia. And, like, we don't know why this is happening to you. So I couldn't click. Right when I was going to get back into videos in February, I couldn't click anymore or type or anything like that. And um, so the doctors couldn't figure out what was wrong. I was getting tested for rheumatoid arthritis um, because it started traveling. It went from my... Uh, it started traveling from my hand up to my elbow and hey Eden <laughs> and uh, I couldn't use it was getting so bad uh, it felt like no matter what I did no matter how many doctors I went to I was going to appointments every single day no matter how many I went to they couldn't figure out what was wrong with me and then it traveled up to my shoulder and that so let's stop there right because that was a lot of information that he used able to give us through this video and you know if we zoom all the way back to the very beginning he started with more vague symptoms and the doctors didn't really 
believe him in terms of what he was dealing with. So they diagnosed him with fibromyalgia. He also had some eyesight problems, um, as you can see here on the right. Um, then he started to have some brain zaps and then noted a lot of really imp uh, important points that I want you guys to understand, which is he's self-isolated. And we'll explain a little more about cat uh, catastrophizing and what happens when doctors might uh, order certain tests and how that might affect your beliefs about you know your capacity then he has some insurance issues um, and then continuing fur further more tests fortunately cleared of tumor but still very com confused still by himself right and then he couldn't click and then te then then more tests right and so you guys can see here that the general theme is that when he went to physicians, he may not have been able to, or he wasn't really provided with a very clear understanding of maybe why certain things were done, as well as what the potential underlying cause was of some of his symptoms. And when you have a lack of understanding or really no grounding to, of, of understanding of what you're dealing with, nor can the authority figures in the space, your medical professionals tell you and then give you this long battery of tests that can affect your beliefs very, very significantly. And we know that with the recent advances in our understanding of pain and pain science, that what we think, how we, what cues are given to us from physicians, meaning uh, a bunch of tests, how they speak to you about certain issues, your own beliefs about certain, your own case and your body's ability to recover, all of that can increase pain. Um, and, and before I get into the actual pain science part of this, you know, did you guys want, have any other points you guys wanted to make about sort of this initial part, right? Because we haven't gotten into the actual physical component yet of, of what we think might be happening. We're, we're really just painting the picture of why he might be dealing with a mental aspect of pain or what we call a psychosomatic part of pain. Exactly. So when we talk about psychosomatic factors, we're trying to put a name to how your mind can actually influence uh, physical pain that already exists. So you can imagine if you're more stressed, suddenly that little noise in the side of your uh, mind when you're studying, it's just even louder it's more prominent so you can imagine how all these other things like going through a battery of tests having to deal with possible tumors it could really really affect someone's physical health because of how much stress and how much extra strain he's having to deal with and it's very important to realize that this can really increase the complexity of a case because now we're not just dealing with some physical injury. Now we have to also manage the mental side and the emotional side. Because oftentimes people are way more than their injury. And you have to treat a whole person, not just the tissues that they may have that are injured. Right. You have to, you have to think about how scared he must have been through this entire process. Um, when people go to physicians or they go to seek out medical treatment, they expect to talk to people that have some kind of a working theory as to what's going on. Uh, the fact that he keeps reiterating over and over and over again, the doctor saying they have no idea what's happening um, can be very concerning. And maybe that's what they said. Maybe that's not what they said, but that's definitely what he heard. Um, so I think just his uh, expression here of this uncertainty, this like lingering fear of just nobody knows what's going on with me and I don't either. And it's like, that's going to make the pain that you're experiencing and all of the symptoms that go along with it uh, 10 times worse in the, the patient's mind. Um, and he, he talks about things like eyesight problems, um, but when he got his eyes checked, there was nothing wrong with his uh, eyes. Um, from a kind of a objective standpoint, he was able to see, but he, he has this perception that he's not able to uh, see what's in front of him. He can't read. Um, things like that can 
come from the stress that can be associated with this kind of uh, medicalization process that patients go through sometimes when they're just run through all of these tests, most of which end up being unnecessary. Um, I think uh, you had some points as well about eyesight and how it could potentially be linked to um, maybe uh, the, the issue that we think that he's dealing with, Matt. Right. I mean, I, I do want to eventually touch on that for sure when we get to more of the physical components of why he might be dealing with his symptoms. But I want to touch on what you said, right, where he has these beliefs, he has this fear. And how does that actually increase pain? I'm sure that's probably a question that's going through your guys' head right now. And I want to update you guys on what we know based on the current research for pain science. And so one thing that you guys need to know with pain, and they've done many, many, many studies on this, is that pain relies on context. Pain relies on cues um, to decide. And it it's your perception of any contextual cue and in this case it's maybe the doctors not understanding what's going on it's maybe them tell wanting to do all these tests for a tumor for rheumatoid arthritis for fibromyalgia um, that's giving him the idea that wow something is probably very wrong because they can't figure this out right and in the pain science literature what they say is that anything that suggests that you you need protecting so pain is all about protection, not the state of your tissues. Anything that suggests you need protecting will increase the pain because you are perceiving it as a danger signal. And when you perceive things as a danger signal, your pain will go up. But anything that suggests that you need you don't need protecting and it's safe, and in this case, if you know doctors encouraged him and helped him understand that maybe there is this physical issue that we'll discuss, then it can help him reduce his pain, right? And I want to give, you know, a, a research cardinal, this cardinal study that was done or story about this, this um, individual, a builder, 29 years old. You guys can see right over here. He came into the emergency department. He jumped down from the, from the building and landed on a nail and you can see here boom he landed on a nail went through his shoe and any small movement of the nail was painful he was sedated with fentanyl um, and other really really strong uh, drugs and what they did was wow okay let's pull out the nail and let's see you know what where, where he was damaged when his boot was removed guess what there was no more pain but they found that the nail went between the toes. The foot was completely uninjured because this guy couldn't see through his shoes. So he perceived this, the nail potentially going through his foot. Maybe his job requires him to be on his foot a lot. He needs his foot to work, to be, to, to, real, to do the things that he needs to do on a regular basis for himself and for work. So he has all these danger signals that increases pain. And what actually happens to our body is that the nervous system, the immune system adapts when we experience pain for long periods of time, which we know in the case of corpse, he's been dealing with this for quite a while. We get better at making pain and there's increases in, you know, synaptic sensitivity at different parts of our brains or uh, different parts of the pathways of pain that really are represented as, you know, you have more sensitivity for pain for a cue, you know, whether it be I just move a little bit, it might present as a lot more pain that and not really affecting the tissue or irritating or even stressing the tissue. So the idea is, for instance, let's say, you know, all, all of us right now, let's pinch, just grab our earlobe. Let's pinch our earlobe right now. And if you pinch it as hard as you can, you're going to feel some pain, right? You guys feel a little bit of pain there. But you in no way have damaged your tissue. Your brain is telling you, hey, you should probably stop because it's about protection for someone like corpse or anyone that has dealt with pain for a long period of time, they're going to feel that pain a lot earlier, right? Because they're, you can think of it as a protectometer or your pain meter. 
is way lower in the threshold so he'll experience pain earlier for things that might not be actually affecting his tissues and you know just just to lock in and hammer home this point think about an ankle sprain right how many of us have had, had ankle sprains i have many times i have a flat foot when do you stop feeling pain is it within the first two weeks or three weeks when did you guys stop feeling pain roughly three three weeks yeah what about you john about the same yeah so for me it's like well yeah two to three weeks but during that time the tissue isn't actually healed they've shown in the research that it takes roughly four to six weeks at least for specific ankle sprains um but the pain is gone right because again pain is about protection not the state of the tissues you know your you're able to begin walking again. You're gradually building up your strength, gradually gradually building up your endurance and mobility, but you're still healing. The tissue is actually still a little weaker. But it, so again, it's all about protection and not where he might actually be damaging his own tissues here. So the the main point that I want to hammer home is that you know a lot of what he is, has been dealing with from the fibromyalgia diagnosis from the, let's say, you know, being on his own, fearful, thinking, having the doctor tell him, we want to check to see if there's a brain tumor. Then he thinks, oh my God, I might have a brain tumor. That's going to up the pain. He doesn't have insurance. Oh my God, how am I going to pay for my ability to treat myself or, or work on myself? He's by himself. And then even worse, let's do more MRIs. Let's do more blood work. Let's still not have a clear idea of what's going on. And he's still isolated. Are those all signals of protection or or danger? Or are they signals of safety? <laughs> like definitely, definitely, danger definitely danger, right? Like, And that will increase his sensitivity. His body will adapt to that. Um, John, did you have something you wanted to say? I think I might have cut you off a little bit. Oh, I wanted to mention that... This isn't to say that there isn't an injury that is present, but all these other factors would make the pain perception even bigger, even stronger. So even if things are healed, like Matt said, or on their way to healing, it could still make any potential aggravation that much more impactful and that much more uh, of a danger signal, which is causing that perception of pain. And obviously, Corpse does have... uh, actual pain as well we're not saying we're not trying to diminish anything but we're just trying to add some context as to why it may be bigger or more than he expects it's very much like a feedback loop like if Mm -hmm. your microphone is too close to your speakers and you start to get all of this extra noise and it starts to kind of uh ramp itself up as the the signal keeps going back and forth between uh the two devices uh, and then it eventually turns into this, like what should have been a normally a quiet, normal sound turns into this big uh, ear shattering uh, noise that you immediately can't tolerate. So that's very much exactly how this works with all of these factors. Uh, the pain signal just gets amplified as it kind of feedbacks, feed, feeds back through all of these different uh, complexities that he has going on with this. Yeah, d- danger uh, signals. So exactly right. So that's where we think that there is this like big um, central sensitization. That's the medical term for a component, that mental component that results in real physical changes in pain. Pain is always real. Okay. No matter where it comes from. We're not saying that it's not real. We're not saying that it's made up. It is very real and it's more sensitive because of what we described. But we do think that there are there is sort of this underlying physical issue that you know need, he he might need to better understand so that all of these other danger signals can be you know more safe for him they can turn to safety signals so let we're going to continue with this and we're going to repeat some of the parts about his uh, right hand pain so that we can help you understand what we're thinking in the videos in february i couldn't click anymore or type or anything like that. And um, 
so the doctors couldn't figure out what was wrong. I was getting tested for rheumatoid arthritis um, because it started traveling. It went from my, uh, it started traveling from my hand up to my elbow and hey, Aiden, <laughs> and uh, I couldn't use. It was getting so bad. Uh, it felt like no matter what I did, no matter how many doctors I went to, I was going to appointments every single day, no matter how many I went to, they couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. And then it traveled up to my shoulder. Danger. And at that point, I was I was so fuck it, but I was also so motivated because I was like, I'm gonna beat this. I'm gonna do like good. I don't know what's wrong with me. I got tested for rheumatoid arthritis. They said, no, I did x-rays, CAT scans, everything. They couldn't figure out what was wrong. I was like, I'm gonna do this shit with one hand. I'm gonna upload videos with one hand, editing everything. Even though, because at this point my eyesight's fucked, so I can't read the stories coming into me. I can't click, so I can't edit that while I record very well. I'm in bed every single day and I don't have anyone here. And I'm losing thousands of dollars per month and like, these people are worried about me, but I'm hard, like I'm scared to post anything. After recording something the, the night before, and my entire left arm, I lost feeling in it. Not just in the, in the wrist up like it progressed before, but now I couldn't move both my arms. And I, again, Reminder, I'm alone and everything like that. I couldn't move either of them. Two months ago, I couldn't move either of my arms. <laughs> you can imagine how frustrating this was because they had no idea why it was happening. I had no explanation besides, you're young, why is this happening? We don't really know. Maybe it's tendonitis or tendonitis only happens if you aggravate it. So why did I wake up? and not have feeling, it, it didn't make any sense. Anyway, I still don't know why it happened. So yeah, it sounds like a neck injury. It, it, I think it was. So, so do we want to just provide the basis of what we think? Because there's other things that he, he says that pretty much lends credence to our hypothesis, our running hypothesis. Um, why don't you yeah, guys, we can, yeah. Why don't you guys kind of start big breaking that down? Yeah. 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 Um, so what he seems to be describing here, um, so just to recap, he says that his arm, or his wrist is the first thing that goes numb in his right hand. And then after he notices, especially uh, when he's typing, that he has weakness um, uh, typing and clicking uh, the mouse. He, mm -hmm. he has difficulty doing that with the muscles of his right uh, wrist and hand. Uh, mm -hmm. Then that problem starts to move upwards towards uh, the elbow and then eventually the shoulder of that arm. Um, so what we think is going on here is something called thoracic outlet syndrome. So if we can pull up the, the skeleton, uh, I can show you here exactly what we're talking about. So the area that we're talking about is called the brachial plexus. And essentially it's this giant bundle of nerves, arteries, and veins that sit there right in the shoulder. Yeah, we can get rid of that upper trap. Um, and you can see that just big, big old mess of uh, nerves, arteries, and veins that come out of the neck, and then they run through that brachial plexus area and then down into the actual arm. And these are all the wires that control uh, the movement and the feeling in your arm, uh, elbow, and hand. Um, so what exactly happens here is the muscles like the scaling muscles on the side of the neck, if you can highlight those for me real quick, those muscles there, as well as a muscle called the pec minor, pectoralis minor, that's a muscle on the front of the chest there. When those muscles become short or tight, what they do is they pinch on some of those structures, whether it be the nerves, whether it be the arteries, whether it be the veins, um, any one of those structures can get pinched. And it's not always exactly the same how it works. Some people only have nerve symptoms. So those are things like numbness and tingling and kind of weakness of muscles. Some people have vascular symptoms. And he mentions at some point in the video that he ha feels a throbbing sensation in the arm. Um, so that would kind of show you that some of the uh, blood flow structures are being pinched. So those arteries or veins. Um, so different people can present with different ways, depending on what exactly is getting pinched, how exactly those muscles are tightening down. But the common theme is that compression of those structures at the shoulder will cause problems deep down 
in the arm all the way to the fingers. And that's usually where it starts when you have uh, this type of an issue. You typically notice it um, further from the source and it slowly moves closer and closer towards the source as it gets worse. Um, so that is exactly what we hear him describing uh, in the video here. And it makes perfect sense with the anatomy um, of the shoulder. So John, if you wanna talk a little bit more about why these muscles get tight in the first place. I think that would be really relevant to a lot of gamers out there. For sure. So you can imagine if you have that typical gamer posture where your shoulders are rounded in, you maybe have a bit of a hunch forward. You can see how those muscles in the side of your neck and, and that pec region in the front of your chest could get shortened. And if they're there for a long time, they can want to stay in that position longer and more easily which can create less space for the nerves and the arteries and the veins to move and to carry the blood or carry those signals that Elliot was talking about. And it will create those symptoms farther down his arm, into his fingers, his hand, his wrist, his elbow. And what we would like to do is change that. So we want to have those shoulders back, that chest nice and open. And what you can imagine is that space gets bigger. And that allows those signals and that blood to actually flow better and will typically relieve some of the symptoms. So especially if you're in that position for a long time, say maybe you fall asleep with your arm over your head, mm -hmm. you can look and see how that tension is creating less space and less area for those signals and blood to move. And then that might be a reason why you would wake up and suddenly your arm is not one of those really, really classic examples would be something like a Saturday night palsy exactly. where you fall asleep on your arm and you're in that position for a long time and maybe you've had a bit too much to drink and suddenly your pain perception is lowered and you're, you're that much more sedated and having that constant pressure and tension and the compression in the area would cause that feeling of waking up and having, oh man, I my fingers feel really tingly and numb and I can't move my hand the way I want to. And it's important to realize that being in the more compromising position could lead to some of these issues. And it doesn't mean that they'll be there forever because we know that even though nerves are something that can take time to recover, they're not any less amenable to treatment than muscles or joints or ligaments or tendons. How much time? How much time do nerves take to heal? Well, that's about one millimeter per day. <laughs> so it that's takes a exactly. long time. It's a very yeah. long time. These nerves, yeah, they can heal, but sometimes, depending on how much pressure and for how long you had it on there, it can yeah. take weeks to months sometimes for this issue to resolve. But you have to deal with the the problem that's causing it in the first place, or it's never going to get better, and you're just going to keep exactly. having these symptoms uh, mm. persist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so let's reveal a little bit, right? How how can we connect everything that he said to what we just described? He woke up one day, maybe he fell asleep in an awkward posture, and maybe he's already more susceptible to this because of him sitting in front of a computer by himself for long periods of time, maybe not in the most ideal of postures, causing some adaptive shortening of his pec minor, maybe his scalenes, maybe some stiffness in his anterior cervical musculature causing elevated first rib, right? These are the three most common entrapment sites. That puts pressure on the nerve. He wakes up, he gets some weakness, some numbness. Right, he nothing changes though. No physicians are able to think or identify that this might be an issue of adaptive changes, something that's orthopedic or physical in nature, and it gets worse. People right? are throwing what? out tendonitis out there too. They're, they're right. saying that he potentially has tendonitis. So I think what they could have been referring to is potentially something like a supraspinatus tendonitis, and so it's a muscle of your rotator cuff. Mm -hmm. So that would kind of present in the same area. But like he says in the video, he didn't do anything uh, repetitive to overuse it. So I think that kind of uh, successfully rules something like that out. And the way that he's describing the, the sensory loss doesn't make any sense for a tendonitis. Exactly, um, exactly. <clears throat> and, yeah. and you know, we know that when nerves are pressed on for longer periods of time, guess what? It's going to get worse. And like you guys said, it will travel up because more of the nerve will be involved. 
So of course it will travel centrally from the hand to the elbow to the shoulder. We know this. Okay, and sorry, where did you want me to go to, Elliot? Um, I think we just uh, continue um, when it starts in his left arm as well. Oh, actually, yeah, I do want to touch on that too, right? Because it, he, we said, he says, okay, well, I still really wanted to make videos, right? And so what did he do? He used his Start left hand with his yeah. left hand. And guess what? If you use your left hand more, when maybe your muscles don't have the enough capacity, they stiffen up. And hey, he wakes up with his left hand experiencing very similar symptoms. His posture definitely could have contributed that to that as well. But he began to dominantly use his left hand and then he wakes up and his left hand and he didn't know why. But there's seemingly a connection there that we can see at least. And I also want to say that Corpse throughout this, he, you can hear how much he wants to get better. He wants to be providing content to his fans and his community. He wants mm -hmm. to be doing the things he loves and he he's getting all these signals that he can't and he can't and he can't but even through all this you can see how positive he wants to be and how forward thinking and that's very admirable because in a situation like that it's very hard to maintain that positive attitude and that willingness to get better so i, I wanted to show that he's he's trying he's trying his damnedest and that's very yeah. very impressive and admirable Exactly. So we will now continue, right? Because we've presented our hypothesis and that we believe what he might have dealt with in the beginning could have been thoracic outlet syndrome. And there are a few things that continue to lead us to believe that. Tendonitis Why is this happening? We don't really know. Maybe it's tendonitis. or but Tendonitis only happens if you aggravate it. So why did I wake up? and not have feeling, it, it didn't make any sense. Anyway, I still don't know why it happened. So yeah, it sounds like a neck injury. It, it, I think it was. So, uh, going on, uh, these doctors can't help me. I, I go to multiple doctors. They're like, we can get you a brace. It's going to take three weeks for it to get here or whatever, uh, for your arm. We don't know why it's happening, but we'll get you a brace. And so I'm like this. This progressed in a, in one week from my right wrist to my to both my entire arms, and you're telling me you'll have a you'll have a brace for me in three weeks for one of my arms because this has to go through insurance and everything like that. I ended up buying braces myself off of like Amazon and everything, trying everything. Like I was in a double arm brace on both my arms that I had to like put on myself, and um, I have chronic insomnia and sleep apnea, so I would. I would wake up and like fucking just hope it wasn't gonna get worse. Um, anyway, after taking anti-inflammatories for a while, I was I was taking so many fucking meds every single day, um, and it was in a double arm brace. I, I managed to do nerve glides to. Well, let's um, pause it here and stretch the nerves in my arms that so just that I could be able to use them. Got it. So he mentions that he. The doctors prescribe him a brace because, of course, they did. Um, but why? What would a brace accomplish in this condition? Well, yeah, what would it, right? How would immobilization, if especially if we're thinking for a thoracic outlet syndrome, how would this help or what would it do? Potentially, an overnight brace could help keep himself out of that posture or if it was something like a figure eight brace maybe it could help keep his shoulders back and that thoracic mm -hmm. outlet area open but it doesn't sound like that's what they ordered it sounds like they got an arm brace which doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me because the problem isn't in the arm it's between the neck and the shoulder um, but they also wanted like, the neck brace too they wanted a neck brace as well yeah yeah oh okay but like purely a neck brace, what is what is that going to do besides maybe prevent him from going into more of a forward head posture? Um, All right. The bracing rod just doesn't seem like it tracks for me um, in any kind of meaningful way. Uh, there's right. some potential things that might be beneficial, but just as a general rule for bracing, um, the problem with a lot of conditions orthopedically is that 
your muscles aren't doing the job that they're supposed to do in the first place to keep you in the right position you need not to be injured so when you add a brace into that mix it just kind of gives your muscles more of an excuse to not do their job more and never really learn how to do their job because now you're relying on an external uh structure to do that for you um so while braces can be very useful in issues where there's like severe contractures um, or things kind of like nighttime splinting, just general brace use uh, when you should be actively stabilizing yourself is typically not the route that we recommend as physical therapists just because it can create a reliance on that uh, external framework. Um, and it's not to say that you know we can't brace, but you can also brace and perform the right exercises if you know for instance the neck brace was used to ensure that he doesn't have this forward head position so these muscles aren't shortened but it, it just doesn't seem like the physician provided him with the appropriate rationale as to why hey we're going to be ordering this neck brace because of this and you know we think it's going to be helping you because of this Instead, it, mm-hmm. it just kind of seemed like uh, we're not really sure what's happening so you know we'll just We'll just do the shotgun approach and we'll just try things, which is, you know, really unfortunate, but quite common in the medical community. Right. And, and you know, I want to emphasize this point. There's good and bad of every profession. And it's up to our own us to take responsibility for our own health. And a lot of the times we don't be we aren't we aren't able to see that because we just fully trust the authority of the white coat or fully trust the authority of go into a medical office they know everything and uh, sometimes it's helpful to it is helpful to trust them but it is also a good idea to zoom out and just realize okay well you know what real information was i given you know and you know what can i act on because a lot of the times we're given only source-based information and when i say source-based i just mean a lot of the treatments that a lot of physicians provide are just addressing source of pain not the cause hey we're going to give you this medication to reduce the pain come back next time mm-hmm. well what we'll caused the pain in the first place uh could be a lot of things but you know we'll just give you this medication yep. and yep. that's it right so we always need to understand what's the cause right and it's okay to ask to figure it out with your physician mm-hmm. um so so john were you going to say something that's a lot sorry oh go ahead but yeah, go ahead, uh, Elliot. Can I jump in here real quick? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was going to say that's that's a lot like taking um, – if you're, if you're in the car and your check engine light comes on and instead of actually taking the time to figure out what's wrong with your engine, taking it to a mechanic, having the, uh, the code read by the machine and then addressing the issue with your engine, um, it's kind of just like taking – a sticker and sticking it over that check engine light like yeah you're you're not going to be as annoyed by that light anymore but your engine still has something wrong with it and not getting to that underlying cause isn't going to do you any favors even in, in the short term you might have reduced uh, the annoyance so that's it's kind of how uh you guys should be thinking about um the approach where it's not really diving deep into what's the cause. Every time you talk to a medical medical provider, always ask what is causing this, not how can I fix it or not? How, how can I, how can I reduce these symptoms? Like try to get to the underlying diagnosis and what is actually happening. Exactly. And I wanted to mention that, especially in the context of using a brace, we know that muscles and tendons and ligaments, soft tissue respond to load. And if you don't load them, then they're going to regress and, and do what you're asking of them, which is not as much. And especially if we know that in Corpse's case, we might be suspecting that there's not enough motion, there's not enough room for those blood vessels and nerves to move. If you're adding a brace to it, you're actually even restricting the motion more. And you could be shortening the muscles more, depending on where the brace is and how it's being used. And it's it could be exacerbating the problem instead of helping but obviously we only know what we're hearing and we're making conjectures based off of that but in our framework you want to load those tissues so that they can get stronger they can move better so that those blood vessels and those nerves can actually move through that potential compression site a little bit more easily and potentially alleviate those symptoms exactly um, I do want to very briefly touch on just how he has some sleep issues. You know, we know 
with our current our current staff at 1HP, you know, both Dr. Daniel Bonner and Dr. Kevin Ho, who have done a lot of research on sleep and sensitivity of pain. If you don't get enough sleep or those who have chronic insomnia, it also elevates pain perception. It also elevates the pain system. So, you know, just a, another added thing that, that helps us identify, hey, this is a complex case and it really needs um, a good team of medical professionals, <clears throat> 1HP, to be able to properly you know, address these multifactorial or multifaceted issues and allow all these danger signals to become more safety signals. Hey, well, what am I doing and how is this contributing positively to my case versus I'm just going to do this and who knows how it's going to help me. Um, but let's go on, right? Like, let's, let's continue to finish off because there's even more evidence to maybe support our idea of... Him again, because I, I, I had a feeling it was a nerve issue. No, they kept telling me it was tendonitis. Um, then they're going, it's fibromyalgia, it's fibromyalgia. Did the nerve glides, I got one of my arms to work again. This is all self-treating myself, by the way. The doctors weren't fucking helping at all. Um, and uh, I eventually got feeling in one of my arms. I got feelings in the other. I went to the doctor, I told them what helped me. Then they sent me to physical therapy. I go to physical therapy still multiple times a week. I, I still, my arms still get ag aggravated, but I can use them now enough to do what I'm doing currently. Through physical therapy, they don't know why it's happening, but they've been doing nerve stretches on my median nerves and radial nerves and fucking ulnar nerve. Oh, oh my ulnar nerve was fucked up. They are hoping I didn't have to do surgery because they fake diagnosed me with carpal tunnel and all this shit. Sash in the fucking chat, fucking sash. Okay, we just need to stop there. We're sad and also disappointed at our fellow physical therapists who may have worked with corpse because of how, again, maybe contributing to some more potential danger signals and saying you have carpal tunnel or your nerves are fucked up. You know, having and maybe perpetuating that belief is, is not helpful to someone that has been dealing with pain for an extended period of time. And as medical professionals, we have to be very sensitive to that. It's not, it's not something we can just take lightly and say words matter in the medical field. Um, 100%. Yeah. So, and and both yeah, I'm just mind blown that physical therapy, let him walk out of there, not knowing what's going on. Yeah. I feel like just textbook thoracic outlet. Exactly. And, and really, right? Like by the and end again, of a visit. Like who knows what they actually said, but that's what mm -hmm. he heard. And, yeah. And yeah. Um, that's why it's always really important when you're talking to your patients. Okay. This is what I just said. Now tell me what you heard or tell me what you understood. And they kind of reiterate that back to you. And then you can really understand what's going on in your patient's head, what they really mm -hmm. retained. Um, and a lot of times you'll be surprised that what you said and what they heard were two different things. Exactly. And th I think that happens a lot more to us than we realize. And a lot more of us as professionals can do a better job of really trying to understand where our patients are at and what their, their comprehension level is of all of the technical stuff that we said. Because it's really easy for us. Um, we see the same things day in and day out. Um, understand all the nuance of how everything works. And I think we forget a lot of times how much we know um, mm -hmm. and how it doesn't really come across well to uh, the patients that we're working with um, when they're being exposed to all of these concepts and principles that we understand uh, like clockwork. So a sign of a good healthcare practitioner is one that makes sure that you understand everything that's happening what is going through the doctor's head before you leave. If you aren't sure or if you have questions, you need to also speak up. But it's also up to the healthcare practitioner to be sensitive to the idea of what Elliot just said. Well, did they really understand what I said? Or maybe I used too much jargon. Maybe sometimes, and I'm sure many of you guys do this, they're just kind of nodding like, yeah, okay, I get it. Whereas they might be lashed onto one thing that you said and then the inner chatter just goes off and then they don't listen. 
how many times has that happened to all of us with many things, right? You hear a really big thing that you know you need to attend to in the day, and you just kind of tune out because your inner chatter goes off. And in the same way, we have to be sensitive to that, and that's why, as many of us don't realize as healthcare professionals, is that time that you spend with your patients are very, very impactful. What you provide to them, verbal and nonverbal, provides everything to the patient in terms of their understanding of how they need to proceed. So, you know, again, continue to urge our fellow practitioners working with chronic pain or working with um, gamers, be be mindful of this. Mm -hmm. I completely Uh, agree. And... I also wanted to point out that Corpse was doing some what we call nerve glides to help move those those nerves that were compressed, and Matt's demonstrating them right now, and oh, he got some relief, flossing. which really really re- lends credence to our hypothesis that this isn't really a tumor problem. It's not a pathological problem. It's a mechanical orthopedic issue, and if we can leverage that side of things and make sure that he's moving well and maybe adjust a bit of his posture then the symptoms should improve and it's it's just like any profession there there are good and bad in everybody and i'm sure that these particular professionals were doing all they could with what they had and that we don't need it trying to talk we're not not. trying to target these professionals i'm not saying that they're they're bad or in in any way it's just that you know not all of not every professional is maybe updated on things like pain science. And, you know, exactly. it is it is more recent in evidence, which is why, unfortunately, these cases happen very commonly. Um, and, and we just want to raise the awareness that, you know, what a good visit looks like in, in the eyes mm-hmm. of, you know, hopefully, you know, decent healthcare professionals. I don't know if we are, but we do our best also. Thank so. You. Um, let's finish this off with uh, the rest of what he's saying. Um, now that I'm in physical so about therapy, a minute I have left. multiple appointments every week. I plan on coming back, right? I don't know why these things happen to me in the first place, so it's kind of scary because I don't know when it's going to happen again. Um, but yeah, supposedly everything's good now. All right, now we're jumping to 2021, the yeah. time of this filming. This was about last week that he posted this on Twitter, and um, that's really what got us interested in this case. Thank you guys for everything. Exactly. That's been fucking rough. I had a really bad doctor appointment lately where they diagnosed me with basically yeah, my illness being un- uncurable. Like, it's so weird, like, um, not having an answer for four years, and then the doctor being like, the doctor didn't want to tell me. Yeah. She like diagnosed me with this thing and then like tried to get me out the door. And I was like, wait, you were so talkative a second ago. You can tell when someone's like hesitant to, she was like, no, go see your primary. Anyway, um, I'm just dealing with that. And ever since that, it's kind of felt really weird. So, so that is, you know, obviously pretty heavy in terms of the end but you know i think something that we can point out that's pretty positive is that he's still been able to stream he's still been able to do things right so there's definitely some positive light in this and i I know he's probably making some progress here and there but this belief is a key thing we have to address if we zoom all the way back to the beginning of this or rewind right we're talking about pain science here if he continues to have this belief he can limit his own progress because he will feel pain earlier before he is doing anything wrong with his tissues and he'll stop and he'll do less and less and less. And what we know when we do less, our body is capable of performing less as an adaptation. And the opposite, it's been shown with the pain literature, moving helps to reduce this increased sensitization. Improving our capacity helps with this. But of course, one of the most important things is you need a good coach that understands pain science that can help you gradually do more and more every single day, help you understand what you're feeling and why. 
and why yeah, it's okay is- to yeah right why it's still okay to do things yeah. when you are in pain and that is the hardest part for many many individuals to understand well i'm in pain i should stop and there's the big thing well actually we know again everything i said before about pain science pain is not about the state of your tissue so you don't always need to stop um, sorry, what were you guys going to say? I was going to say that concept is called fear yeah. avoidance, and it's a huge thing that we look at when patients kind of come in uh, speaking like this. Uh, we call it catastrophic language. Um, if the patient is beginning to catastrophize um, their condition, um, there's, there's, I, I can't think of uh, a situation where um, this would be true, where he's going to be in pain like this for the rest of his life. Um, barring a, uh, like just a freak tumor in his brachial plexus that's growing out of control, which I I don't think is the case here. Um, barring something like that, uh, I, I really don't see how, uh, a, a physician can make, um, a diagnosis like that or make a statement like that, that they're going to be in pain for the rest of their lives and be... Uh, only only able to find relief through injections occasionally. Like what injections are gonna, what, what condition is gonna cause you to have pain for the rest of your life that injections are gonna, gonna address in any kind yeah. of meaningful way. Uh, it just doesn't track, it doesn't make sense. Um, and it really does go to show how much fear and avoidance behavior he's really internalized. Um, and it's 100% not his fault. It really is the system, I think, that has failed him here. And it's not any one provider. He's been involved with so many yeah. different professionals, mm-hmm. told him so many different things. Um, yeah. I, I wouldn't be surprised if he's just given up hope in the entire medical community at this point as being right. useless. I wouldn't blame him yeah. for having that belief. Exactly. Um, exactly. But I think it really is important to uh, look at things critically and understand all facets of why you're experiencing pain whether it be actual the mechanics of your muscles and bones and tendons or the kind of psychological perspective that comes along with that and i just i my final thoughts i guess on this whole thing are just it's it's really important to look at the patient as a whole person yes can't say that enough you know just completely well said we know how frustrating this must be. He he says it over and over in his own videos, you know, and yeah. imagine the physician side as well, right? Coming, having a patient come in and has a history of 50 visits. That's a lot of also information for that physician to process. And guess what? And they don't have time. He, they don't he have or time she to process. Yeah, yeah. only has five minutes. Yeah. So what's going to happen? Uh, I have to provide him with something, uh, diagnose, a uh, test. This is what, yeah. what happened to him. This is why the system failed him. Because the insurance may have caused him to only be only have five minutes available with his physician because the physician needs to make money. And as a result, he gets all these tests and beliefs and danger signals. It progresses to this point he really thinks that he has this severity of his condition where he can't. Um, mm-hmm. So it's just really unfortunate. Yeah. And to unpack the tweet a little bit more, he talks about a needle EMG, which is a test specific for nerves. And it's used to test how well your nerves can communicate from your brain and your spine down to whatever their target is. In this case, likely some of the muscles of his arm. And uh, it is a gold standard test for seeing how well a nerve can communicate, but it doesn't tell you, like we've been harping on this entire time, what the actual cause is. It may say that the source of the problem is this particular nerve, but it doesn't say why. Why is this nerve not communicating as well? Check and engine light. It's essentially an internet test yep. for your nerves. Yep. Yeah. It, and it seems like he's not like you both mentioned, he's not getting the information that would alleviate some of these danger signals that he's getting from every, every, every side where it's just, no, you can't, you're, you're never going to feel better. You're always going to have pain. You're, you're only the only ever going to feel better if we inject you with this strong drug, with this, with this syringe. And that's awful to hear. 
And I'm sure that the physician or the PT or whoever was working with him was only doing the best they could with what they had. And exactly. yeah, there's only one situation in which that would be true that yeah. you're going to be you're going to have problems for the rest of your life. And that's if the nerve was completely severed and completely mm. torn all the way through. But in that case, yeah. you would be paralyzed. Your arm wouldn't work. Spinal cord exactly. patients yeah. are, are on kind of the other side of this. Uh, a lot mm -hmm. of times the difficulty with spinal t cord patients is they believe that they're going to recover um, some yeah. kind of use of their lower extremities and they haven't accepted the fact that that's just not going to happen, um, exactly. which makes uh, kind of the opposite problem for the clinicians working with them um, because you have a hard time teaching them the skills that they're going to need to adapt uh, mm. to their new way of life now that they have complete severance of the, the motor function. Um, or the ability to move the muscles. Um, but that's not what's happening here because he's still able to stream. He's still able to play. He's still engaging yep. with the audience, still making videos. He has mm -hmm. not lost complete function. The nerves are not completely severed. Um, and yep. I think that is a, a statement that we can make pretty definitively here. So that is really the only situation where a needle EMG would be related to permanent disability or pain. Um, and that I don't think is what's happening here. Um, so other than that, uh, nerve compression injuries can happen in grades. You can have a little bit of compression of the nerve, which kind of causes that numbness and tingles for a little bit, and then it goes away. And then a little bit more serious compression of the nerve to where actual damage was done to the nerve at a certain point. But that damage is reversible. Nerves heal. Um, and it's only when you get into that complete severance of the nerve, the nerve is damaged beyond repair. Like it's never going to repair because it's completely cut in half. That's when you really have... Uh, the issues of long-term disability, and then you have to start developing alternative ways to live your life. So I just want to end with, you know, if any of you guys watch this and, you know, corpse, if you happen to stumble upon this video, we'd be happy to help you as a team to help you better understand this. Um, in general, you know, just for the general gaming population, I think these are really important points for you guys to understand about your own issues, nerve issues, um, maybe how to assess whether a medical visit was successful or not. Um, just ho hopefully we can raise some more awareness about this as to why we were so taken aback by this tweet and why we felt the need to create this video, right? It's really about education. It's about raising awareness. We don't care about clout. Yeah. We want you guys to have a better management of your health through just being more aware of these things. So uh, you want someone else to see this video that may be going through something similar or have kind of a similar story about confusion about their diagnosis um, we want them to understand that there may be hope. And I think that's really mm -hmm. what we're trying to spread at the end of the day is hope. Exactly. Yeah. There's hundred percent hope.